Welcome to Wake Up with Nubian Tigers Talk. Nubian Tigers are a group of people who met at Princeton University and have continued to be friends throughout the decades. The COVID-19 pandemic and the civil demonstrations following the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd by the police motivated us to harness our life experiences and professional expertise and contribute our voices to the broader discussion of the conditions of life throughout Black America. My name is Michelle Jacobs, and I'm with my co-host, Ray Smaltz. Over to you, Ray. Thanks, Michelle. And for those of you listening for the first time, the acronym W-A-K-E, or WAKE, stands for Wisdom, Advice, Knowledge, and Engagement. And the UP is the abbreviation for Princeton University, only backwards. When the late civil rights icon and longtime congressman, John Lewis was only 23 years old, he delivered an inspiring speech at the historic march on Washington in 1963 and punctuated the end of it with, wake up America, wake up, for we cannot stop and we will not and cannot be patient. This podcast aspires to wake up our listeners to some of the very same struggles within America today and across the globe. Okay, well, Ray, this is our 14th episode. Can, Can you, you imagine? That? I know, it seems, it seems hard to believe. I was count and... up to five. <laughs> and it's the end of our season, and what a better way to close it out mm -hmm. than to bring Mary Nelson and Larry Ham back, who talked to us back in October when we were anticipating the election, and they're going to give us their uh, thoughts and evaluation of what actually occurred. Absolutely. So with, it's going to be a fascinating talk, and uh, we're not going to spend any time messing around. We're just going to jump right into it. Mm -hmm. So Larry, tell us... Um, uh, at the end of the last time we had you, you guys were in the round table and you were talking about some things you were going to do and uh, what to look out for, et cetera. So what were you doing between the last time we talked to you and uh, the election itself? Well, since the last time we talked, uh, we did, when I say we, I'm referring to members of the People's Organization for Progress, of which I am a part. Um, uh, historically, every year for the last at least uh, 20 years, we do voter registration every year. We usually do it from the first uh, weekend in March. We do it every Saturday uh, in downtown Newark, outside, outdoors. Uh, and we do it every Saturday from the um, first Saturday in March to the cutoff date, whatever that date is in October. This year, the cutoff date in New Jersey, the cutoff date for registration is 21 days before the general election. So I think that fell like around October 13th. So um, we got hit, of course, with COVID in the spring. And so there was a lockdown. We did not do our registration uh, in March, March through uh, May, but we resumed, uh, I believe, the first Saturday in June. And we carried out voter registration every Saturday from June through uh, October uh, 13th. And we got a good response. We registered a whole bunch of folks. Uh, folks were enthusiastic about registering because people on the street, uh, they wanted to see the end of the Donald Trump regime. So uh, all they had to do, you know, we out there with the mics and the loudspeakers and stuff. So as soon as we say Trump must go, you know, people come over to the table and they start to register. We don't we don't have a problem during the presidential election years. In other years, it's more sparse and is more, you know, encouraging and cajoling to get people to register, but not during the presidential election, and especially not this year. But I have to say, uh, and then um, after registration was over, we engaged in voter mobilization, but uh, the voter mobilization, well, one part of it was a big event that we had every year since um, uh, the fall of 2015, People's Organization for Progress has had a Trump must go march and rally. And this year was no different. And it was very well attended. But, you know, this summer, you know, this was the summer of protests. You know, this was a summer of protests, something akin maybe not to the, the 60s where, you know, there were outright rebellions, but in terms of mass protests, we saw more people in the streets this summer all across the United States than probably uh, in, in any time in, in I haven't seen this many marches since I was uh, a freshman Absolutely. in high school. 
absolutely. If you know anything about New Jersey, when people in places like Belleville and Clifton are having Black Lives March, Black Lives Matter marches, you know something is going on. Little Fairy, you know something is going on. There were marches in over 150 cities in New Jersey alone. Mm. And so this helped with our voter registration and it also helped uh, with our, our Trump must go rally, which was also big and, you know, in organizing for that, that also involved voter mobilization, telling people don't forget to vote, go to the polls. And then uh, we did a lot of online stuff too, to tell people to vote. Now I have to say something just on the personal side, you know, I ran uh, for U.S. Senate. But I started, once Bernie Sanders ended his campaign in April, he voluntarily uh, suspended his campaign and said he was going to support Joe Biden. I knew something was up. I was disappointed that Bernie ended his campaign. I think he should have went through to the Democratic Convention, you know, to carry the platform forward, et cetera, et cetera. But he made a decision. I think he made that decision because he saw something going on. You know, as a national candidate going all around the country, he has a perspective on things that even activists like me might not have. And I think he saw something was going on and he probably felt people needed to get behind Biden because that was the only way Trump was gonna be defeated. And I felt- It needed to get behind it, Larry, ASAP. Right, right. So I'm saying that from that point, even before my primary election, I actually started telling people, and it, it was in my literature. In fact, if you look at my campaign literature and you look at the platform, at the top of the platform was defeat Donald Trump. And why did I do that? Because I was getting pushback from people. You know, we all sitting here now, you know, after dancing in the street, you know, the Wicked Witch is dead, you know, we are. Oh, now we know how people in third world countries feel about us, right? When, when they overthrow dictators that we put in, install, that we install, right? I mean, literally, that's what had people dancing in the street because the dictator was dead. Well, not dead, they knew he was, he was defeated. But we started getting pushback from people. You know, not just people on the left, say for instance, people who supported Bernie and didn't want to support him, but in the, the, the left, the center, the right. And I said from the beginning, I said, well, from that period, that this election was going to be close. You know, there are people who were saying that Joe Biden is going to steamroll Trump, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I felt that it was going to be close because I was getting pushback from people, uh, even while we were doing voter registration. So when you say people, while, what kind of people? Who, who was giving you pushback? Black people. I mean, that, that, that's the community I'm interacting with, right? Yeah. But not just Black people, also progressive people. You know, a lot of people that supported Bernie Sanders, some of them, I think the vast majority followed Bernie's lead and said, okay, we're going to do Biden. But there were a lot, there were others. There was a percentage, you know, a smaller percentage that said they couldn't vote for Biden, just knowing his history, just you know, knowing everything that went down before he was vice president and then everything he went down after he was vice president. There was pushback there, but it wasn't only there because if you if you were watching the media, they were always asking that question. Are Bernie Sanders people going to support Joe Biden? But it wasn't just Bernie Sanders people. It was other people too. And we were getting pushback. So I started saying, as early as, as uh, uh, May, that I would support whoever the Democratic Party nominee would be. And it was the presumptive nominee was Joe Biden. And I was doing that because I could feel that this was not going to be an easy lift. I could feel that we were going to have to push and push and push to get people to vote for Biden. And people did vote for Biden. He got more votes than any other candidate in history. But the other side of that is that the number two candidate in American history is Donald Trump. Yeah. I mean, what do you say when 74 million, despite everything that Trump has done, right. 74 million people still voted for him. Mm -hmm. And some of them were people of color. Mm -hmm. Now it wasn't no big increase, 
but the the number of black women voting for Trump increased. The number of black men voting for Trump increased. Still, those two demographics were the top two demographics voted for Biden, but there was some increase. And it wasn't by accident mm -hmm. because Trump and his people made efforts to get those votes. So it, it's it's real interest. I think people, and I'm going to shut up, <laughs> you know, so people can talk. I think <laughs> this election is going to be studied for generations to come. Yeah. I think this was really a crossroads in American politics. And there are strong parallels between what happened this fall, and, or you could say this campaign season, and what happened in 1877 with the Tilden Hayes Compromise. I also think somewhere else we should be looking is what happened in Germany prior to the rise of Adolf Hitler. Because you know, when we see these World War II movies, we never see what happened before the war. The movie starts with the war, with right. people in the battlefield. Yeah, yeah. But you never see what went on in Germany in the same way a lot of people are not taking Trump seriously. That, that was in Germany too. They didn't take uh, uh, Hitler seriously. They called him the same names that they called Donald Trump. Clown, buffoon. Right. You see how much of a clown he was, but he didn't seize power. He used the system. He was elected and through their parliamentary system, he became chancellor, then president, then they combined the offices of chancellor and president and called it the Fuhrer. That's real. That's a yeah. type. It's not a nickname. The mm -hmm. Fuhrer. He was, he was like a dictator. Trump is doing the same thing. Nothing Trump is doing is illegal. He is using all the trap doors, the hidden passages of the Constitution and the laws, pushing that envelope as far as possible to mount the biggest challenge to democracy, to the democratic process in the history of this country, even in the Tilden Hayes Compromise. There, nobody had filed 50 lawsuits <laughs> against the government. You, know, nobody, you yeah. didn't have attorney generals all over the state, you know, coming up. This thing is very serious. It's much more serious. And just because Trump was not reelected, we were lucky. We dodged the bullet. What if mm -hmm. someone comes along more sophisticated, more uh, of an evil genius, so to speak, then Donald Trump, we're going to be in trouble. Well, and also, we, you say we dodged a bullet, but we don't know the land, where the landmines are, right? We know, that there's a, we know that there are some landmines out there right now, but we don't know where they are. Uh, and so it'll be interesting. I think you're right about uh, how people will study this election because it mm -hmm. says something significant about us as Americans, although we're not all going to agree <laughs> well, it, <laughs> on it, what it, exactly Michelle, the it bullet, says. The bullet hasn't stopped yet because yeah, Georgia is yet. going to dictate a lot of what this administration is able to do in the next yeah. four or four plus years, depending on whether um, you know Biden doesn't run and Kamala runs in his place or whatever. I mean, we could just, you know, we could be just as stonewalled as we have been um, if the Republicans are in control again. Yeah, yeah, we can. Well, let's 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 uh, roll to Mary, and um, because she she told us a little bit before the show that she also did some pollster. She worked at the polls, so uh, let's get um, let's get her feedback on that, and then I would like you guys to comment on what's been going on since the election. What I did on election day, I thought was was really interesting because I worked for the Missouri Democratic Party that holds a voter protection project across the entire state of Missouri. And what I did working in the boiler room was field calls from our folks who were um, not licensed, but certificated as election judges, election challengers, and rovers. And so they were all over the state watching how long the lines were getting, looking at 
things like um, polls running out of ballots or machines not working properly. Um, we were trying to troubleshoot things as the day developed to make sure that everybody who showed up got to vote. One of the things that I think that we saw is that with the introduction of mail-in ballots and a lack of clarity about what happens when, remember when there was so much talk about not relying on the U.S. mail, there was an out and out sabotage by the federal government to make people very aware of the fact that if you put your ballot in the mail two weeks before election day, there's a chance that it won't arrive on time. And there were a lot of people who changed their minds. They applied for a mail-in ballot, but they decided at the last minute to vote in person. And so there were a lot of people who didn't understand whether they could still vote because they had in fact received a mail-in ballot. So I think we lost some voters that way who never even showed up at the polls because they were confused. Then there were people who tried to use their mail-in ballot on election day. In Missouri, you may not use a mail-in ba ballot to vote in person. A mail-in ballot must be mailed in Missouri. People didn't understand that. And then you have a lot of poll workers and Missouri didn't have enough poll workers because so many of our poll workers are elderly people who are afraid of COVID. So they set out this election. Then, so you have young people who have been trained in one or two sessions to interpret these new rules in place. And so a lot of mistakes were being made. But I think we were able to address a lot of those problems when they came to our attention to make sure that it it went as smoothly as possible. But we now know where those pitfalls are. And one of them certainly is that compared to other states, Missouri leaves no recourse to a voter whose um, signature on a mail-in ballot gets challenged. In other states, those people would be notified by the election authority so that they can come in and address the discrepancy. In Missouri, they just discard your vote. So we don't know how many votes were not counted because of that issue. But of course, Missouri is a very red state. Although we have, you know, a big rural um, community, lots of farmers who were hurt by the trade wars with China, who could not sell their crops to China, they still voted Trump because they hate black people. We are so divided racially in Missouri, famously or infamously now that I don't know that we'll be able to get beyond that for some time. Um, and I, I have to say too, that in the city of St. Louis, which is now majority African-American, we were able to push off a challenge against Kimberly Gardner, who was our first African-American uh, prosecutor in the city and who was pursuing uh, the prosecution of the McCluskeys, who very, you know, in an ugly way, made St. Louis famous again for it, the ugliness of them pulling guns on Black Lives Matter's protesters. Um, today, as recently as today, I read that she was thrown off the case by a judge who challenged her as having a conflict of interest. So, I mean, Missouri has a lot of issues, but it will be a long time before we're able to have some equity in how we vote. I mean, I don't think we're as bad as some states, but we are extremely bad with our Republicans here who will do anything to suppress the Black vote. Mm. Yeah, I, just, I just want to yeah. add to that 
add to what Mary said. She made some excellent points and it made bells go off in my head about the voting process here. In Jersey, we had vote by mail for the first time. And I want to say initially, uh, when the idea first started floating around, we publicly came out and supported vote by mail. But I have to say, having gone through the process, vote by mail was no magic panacea either. It did bring more people, it did cause a significant increase in the number of ballots cast. And I think that was nationwide and I think, but there were problems with the vote by mail. You know, there, first of all, just the adjustment that people had to make going from voting, you know, in the voting booth to voting by mail. And <laughs> I'm a Princeton graduate, right? When I opened that envelope and pulled out all these papers for my, I was like, man, I'm gonna have to set two hours aside <laughs> to read all this stuff, mm. you know, and, and I know a lot of people didn't. I did because I wanted to cast my vote and, you know, I'm supposed to be trying to help other people. So I have to understand the process. But number one, it has to be simplified. The, 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 the whole vote by mail thing, I, I think is good, but it's going to have to be evaluated, strengths and weaknesses, and correcting, you know, some of the, the, the problems. There were some problems with vote by mail. It, it wasn't perfect, but it did get more votes, you know, uh, cast overall. But uh, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't a walk in the park. Um, the other problem with vote by mail is that it took 32 days for the official results of the primary election to be, count, to be actually posted by the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. And we used to finding out what, night of, next day, who the right. candidates are. But the official results, I mean, people knew who the winners were generally, but the, it took them 32 days to count the ballots right. and get official numbers and post them. I'm sorry, I cut you no, off. No, that's okay. I, I, just on, on the, the mail-in ballot, so in the conversation that we had with the Tigresses, several of them said they used the mail-in ballot specifically because they were not interested in going to the polls directly. Uh, mm -hmm. whether they had health issues or whether or either whatever their reasons were. So between New Jersey and, and Missouri, did you folks find that when you spoke to black folks that they availed themselves of mail-in ballots or were they more determined to do it in person? I, I'll I defer to Mary. Yeah, I think a lot of people did use mail-in ballots, even though in between the city of St. Louis and St. Louis County that I'm most familiar with, there was a, a, a marked difference about how easy it was. The county provided drop boxes. The city did not. You could go to a public library in the city and cast your mail-in ballot, but only they would, they would give you uh, a, a opportunity to vote with a voting machine, but you couldn't use a paper ballot if you showed up with a mail-in ballot in your hand. You could only use a voting machine. So it made for a lot of differences. And you know, with the city and the county being essentially across the street from each other and people coming and going all the time, there was a lot of misinformation being shared about what you could do in the city versus what you could do in the county. So black people just kind of had their hands in the air. And that's not even to talk about the fact that your mail-in ballot had to be notarized. And notaries are notoriously hard to, to, to find, but some very um, forward-thinking people got a bunch of notaries available to place them at different locations so that you could come through and get your ballot notarized easily. But they, it, it wasn't an easy thing. And you know, black people, once they get confused and once they get frustrated, they don't want to vote. And the turnout reflected that Acro compared to how folks turned out across the nation in the city and county of St. Louis, the turnout was fairly low at 60%. See, I think things like notary, notarizing ballots, that, that's voter suppression. 
Absolutely. That's that's voter that's voter suppression. No question. I agree. We didn't we didn't we didn't have that in Jersey. You know, in fact, the other thing is the difference was, you know, before vote by mail, election day was whatever the date was for us, the primary, it was July 7th. That was election day. And so normally that's when people voted. But with vote by mail in Jersey, election day was when you got your ballot. And that's what we had, that's what we had to tell people over and over again. Don't wait till election day to mail to mail your ballot in. Do it right now. People actually received most of the ballots by October the 5th. So they literally had a whole month to vote. And I think I think that was good, actually. I think that was good. You know, one of the, the better aspects of, of the vote by mail process. And uh, fortunately, in the county that I live, Essex County, you know, Democratic Party controls the majority, uh, uh, is in power in the majority of towns and in the county. So the county was helping. It, it was not a contradiction between the county and, and the uh, municipalities, you know, everything. I think the, the big thing was just getting people to adjust to this new system. We did have a kind of hybrid, like everybody in the state received a ballot if they were on the voter roll, they received a ballot, but polls was a limited number of polling places were opened on election day for people, you know, who for whatever reason didn't use the mail-in ballot. And I'm gonna tell you something, there were a lot of people that went to the poll. There were a lot of people that used the mail-in ballots. There were a lot of people that also chose to go in and cast their ballot because some people were afraid that if they mailed their ballots with uh, DeJoy pulling all the uh, mail sorting machines out of the postal centers, a lot of people were concerned that their ballot was not going to get uh, to where it had to go on time, that their right. ballot might not end up being counted. So right. a lot of people, you know, chose to go in and right. cast their ballot. Right. Mm -hmm. We we heard that reflected uh, last week in the discussion as well. But, you know, it's an interesting point. I hope some organizations are keeping a list <laughs> of all of the challenges that occurred with the mail-in ballots because we don't need to wait till the next presidential election mm -hmm. to <laughs> try to work that out. Uh, and those should be the types of things, um, you know, those are the local type of issues that people should be working on all along without there needing to be a presidential election uh, on, on the horizon. So, so now we have the election, you know, um, I forgot what the date was, Saturday, the whatever that Saturday was when it finally became known that um, Biden had received the- It was Freedom Day. Yeah, and yeah. everybody was dancing. Well, freedom for some, right? <laughs> don't don't make me go into my friend. Right, freedom, freedom for some. some. Yes. I, <laughs> um, so I'll so people were dancing that. in the street and carrying on, um, and then the onslaught. Right? The the as the BBC said today, the alternate reality, mm. <laughs> um, split screen United States. I thought that was pretty interesting right. the way they described that. Mm where we have uh, you know the president who's in power say he won <laughs> and he's going to do everything in his power to keep the people who actually won from uh taking office so now we're what 51 lawsuits in something to that effect so mary from from the perspective of someone who's actually been an elected official uh what's your take on the whole lawsuit challenging the results the lawsuits well, let me just let me just clarify. I haven't been elected. Right, right, right. I have True. been appointed. You okay? appointed for someone who was elected. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's an interesting question. You know, I didn't mention it before, but after I worked from five o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night on election day, I went home and went to sleep. I did not watch the television. I wanted to wake up in the morning and find out who our new president was. As it turns out, when I turned on the news the next day, since it was still, you know, up in up in the air, I didn't watch television until that Saturday when Biden's election. Man, you're seemed good. Sure you're, you're, you're good. I, I was it. the same. I was the same. I couldn't take it. Uh, I, was I even did a Twitter blackout. I, I didn't want to hear it. Anxious because mm. I do not trust 
the, the Republican Party. I do not trust Donald Trump. And I know that they are anti-democratic. They only care about holding on to power. That's all they care about. They don't give a flip about elections, the constitution, the, the institutions that make our country a republic. They don't care. And so I knew that the stuff was going to start. And certainly the stuff started. And it was, you know, it went from this whole thing about undermining the Postal Service, attacking states who provided mail-in voting for their uh, constituents, supporting all kinds of voter suppression tactics, allowing local election offices to close down polling sites and force everyone in Texas especially to go to one polling site per county so that millions of people would have to vote at one polling site. It was ridiculous the amount of, of really seriously illegal suppression that was going on throughout the election period so that I knew to expect that that kind of pressure would only continue and continue and continue. And that's what we're seeing. And, you know, to look at the news, you would think that this was almost a coup or an attempted coup or some kind of anti-democratic movement. This was an attempted coup. Let's be clear. And just to get back to Larry's point earlier about how historians will look at this period, there are some very, very upsetting parallels between the rise of Trumpism and the rise of fascism in Europe. Just study the history. PBS had a really excellent program about the rise of Hitler, and there were startling similarities. But you know, the American people in 2020 are dumb. <laughs> They're stupid. They can easily be misled. And I think that all of the political advisors who are advising Trump have been looking at elections of progressively stupider politicians from Ronald Reagan forward. The Bushes, okay? Stupider, stupider, dumber and dumber, with people relying on norms. Then a Donald Trump comes along who has no respect for the law, no less the unwritten law of norms, and just totally disregarded everything and pushed us to the brink of losing our democracy. And I don't know that people really appreciate how close we are to that point. And as Larry said, all it's going to take is a smarter Trump to get away with it. Because I was shocked. I have no confidence in these people, but even I was shocked at the number of Republicans who were willing to let this president get away with clear crimes and said nothing. They sat on their hands. So I'm not surprised that 126 of them were willing to sign off on this foolish little lawsuit, this political theater before the Supreme Court. It wasn't about winning. It was about keeping that base close to them so that they feel victimized and cheated so that they'll be ready to go into revolt when Trump gives them the signal. Amen. Can I uh, ask a question, Larry, before you go, and, and Mary, what were, your, what were your impressions of, so the very first things that the, the Trump lawyers started to do and, and uh, talk about with uh, the public was invalidating the votes of basically black communities, right? And in particular, um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Madison area, Detroit, Michigan, Philadelphia, those were the, the, and ultimately Atlanta, 
those were all of the major black um, metropolises that they started going after to say those votes shouldn't count. What, what, what did you, how did you guys react to that stuff? Well, we were outraged. I mean, let me, let me just say, you, you asked earlier, where were we when the news came that uh, Biden had gotten a sufficient number of electoral votes? We were actually having protect our vote rallies. We, we, we didn't know the announcement was going to be made that Saturday morning, November 7th. So we had people were having, including our organization, protect our vote rallies. I was at a protect our vote rally in front of the federal building in Newark on Saturday with groups like CWA, uh, 1132 BJ unions, um, Working Families Party, People's Organization for Progress, and others when we got the news. And, you know, just like everywhere else, somebody was listening to the radio in the car and they said, Biden got it. And people just burst out, you know, in exuberant uh, celebration. Uh, but we, we did continue. Eventually, we did continue on with what we were doing. But what's interesting is that all up and down Broad Street in Newark, as people passed us, they were blowing their horns. You know, it was something spontaneous that just broke out. But I just want to say amen to everything uh, that Mary said, because uh, she was hitting, hitting those targets one after the other. Um, we, we, we knew from early on that Trump was going to try to steal this election. Because the Republicans haven't been have been trying to steal all the elections. Trump himself said, you remember what he said, right? He said, if we have vote by mail, we'll never win another election. They can only win by stealing elections. And I think what the big fear uh, on the part of some of them are is that they know that this country's demographics are changing, that by a certain year, I'm not sure what the year is, 20, 35, 20, whatever, it might even be already, that this will be a majority nation of color. And what we, what we have is a kind of neo-apartheid state that is emerging, and they're going to try, these right-wing reactionaries are going to try, these racist right-wing reactionaries are going to try to hold on to power by any means necessary. I predict that our elections for the next 20 years are going to become more and more and more contentious. Uh, just because Trump lost, those 74 million people that voted for Trump are not going away. They, they are going to, remember, the next major election is in two years. Two years is only 24 months. That's nothing. And everybody knows that most presidents, their party loses control of the House in the immediate midterms, midterm election right. that come up, and that's their strategy. They're playing the long game. Okay, we lost this, you know, uh, this 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 part of the game, this quarter, we lost this quarter. Now let's plan for and lay the groundwork for the next quarter. So, you know, our work is really, I, there, there are two things I think really need to happen. I think we need a voting rights amendment. I think the constitution must be amended to, an amendment needs to be in there to guarantee every person's right to vote, then that will make it more difficult for them to engage in this voter suppression because the Constitution does not explicitly guarantee our right to vote. It's mentioned, but it's not explicitly guaranteed. The other thing we got to do is abolish the Electoral College. We must have direct election of the president in this country. Other industrial capitalist countries directly elect. Why, why do we have a little group of people over here, you know, when 150 million people will vote over here, but it's this little group of 538 over here that's actually gonna make the decision. We need to get rid of that. We know it's a vestige of slavery, you know, of, of, of trying to give those slave holding colonies more power uh, than they had. So let's get rid of the electoral college. Let's get a constitutional amendment to guarantee everybody's right to vote. And let's amend the Voting Rights Act to restore its full power. Right on. Yep. Yeah, not with this, not with this Supreme Court. Uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but yeah. I think it's interesting. Uh, we're going to uh, wrap up, but it's interesting that Rush Limbaugh um, made a comment the other day that it might be time for the 17 states to secede 
from the United States. And I'm like, there it is right there. They're still <laughs> fighting the Civil War. They can't Absolutely. let it go. Was they that before or after go. he took OxyContin? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it was uh day before yesterday, I think, uh, in the papers. But, you know, that's that's the crux of it. The 70 million want to be in pre-Civil War era, and the other 70 million, many of whom are black and brown, are not going back there. So um, I want to thank you guys so much for coming back and talking to us. It's, it's uh, we can see that we all have a lot of work left to do, and we can't let anyone go to sleep on the job, because, not even a nap, <laughs> because the fight, as you said, that Larry, that's a great point. The, the midterm elections are just around the corner and people really have to start getting geared up. And I know we're all and seniors. And we gotta win Georgia. We yeah. gotta win Georgia. Yes, gotta win Georgia. And I know we're January. all seniors, but power naps are out, y'all. Okay? <laughs> power naps are gone. <laughs> Let's go to bed early. <laughs> uh, okay, guys, any last words you wanna leave uh, our listeners with um, about the election or uh, thoughts for the future or, or anything the like struggle that? struggle continues. We have to remain vigilant and remember that democracy requires our participation. It is not a spectator sport. I, I agree with Mary, and uh, I just want to say again, we need to win Georgia. Uh, Biden for the first time, Democrats for the first time in 30 years, won Georgia. The momentum is high. We can win Georgia. And that will help us because if, if we have a Republican controlled Senate, we ain't gonna get S <laughs> through, yeah. through there. Nothing. We ain't gonna nope. get stimulus no. or nope. anything else through there. Right. So support Ossoff and support Warnock down mm -hmm. there. Let's get them in and then Kamala Harris, the vice president, becomes the fifty-first vote. Yep. And 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 we can do something then. Well, thank you guys so much. Just like the first time, you're just uh, wonderful. It's a delight to have you with us, and we're so happy and appreciative uh, you agreed to come back. Great holidays, and guys, and stay safe. Comments. Yes, so have a wonderful... Much. To all our listeners, of course, this is going to be our last show before the holidays, so we want everyone to be smart, stay safe, stay inside. <laughs> you can see those people in February. <laughs> you don't need to see them in December. Mail those gifts <laughs> and be safe and stay home. We want you to be here with us when we start back up in January. So happy holidays to everybody. Best happy of holidays. Luck. Yeah. Happy holidays. Thanks again, everybody. Thank Peace. you. And Michelle, that you know, uh, this is this is our last show, as you said earlier, but this has been a year unlike any other, and certainly in my lifetime. And uh, but this show has made it a lot more enjoyable for me personally. Well, thanks, Ray. You know, and it it was a great year. We've had a good time um, and some good experiences on the podcast. But we have twenty twenty one coming mm -hmm. up, and yes, there are do. so many issues that we still have to get to. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we learned in the COVID uh, pandemic was that the disparities in healthcare between mm -hmm. uh, for black people and other folks of color have just been laid out so clearly right. in case people didn't know it before, you can't avoid the fact now. Um, and mm -hmm. so I think we're gonna be having some uh, discussion about the broader healthcare issues in right. our communities. Right, yeah, I, I mean, obviously that, you know, anything with healthcare right now is a much needed topic, especially as, the vaccine, you know, makes its way around the, the country. But, um, you know, the other, another thing, obviously, within 2020, um, that uh, just sparked a different kind of activism was the murder of George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor, and Rayshard Brooks, and people like that. And the way sports took on a different role, a, a social justice role, that um, probably hadn't been seen since the 60s, when Jim Brown and Bill Russell and John Wooten and people like that, Bobby Mitchell were supporting Muhammad Ali when he decided uh, that he wasn't going to uh, serve for the United States in, uh, in Vietnam. Yeah, there's that. And then, you know, the whole issue of police reform as a mm -hmm. result of uh, the killings of the ongoing killings, I should say, of black people. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll be looking at the issues around police reform. Uh, how does the Biden-Harris uh, administration, how is that going to impact 
our ability mm -hmm. to get any significant uh, police reform. And speaking of the Biden-Harris people, there's also mm -hmm. this question now of Biden's uh, recommendation that Vilsack be the um, head of the agricultural right. uh, department. And you, right. as you, you know, many small farmers, including black farmers, mm -hmm. uh, don't particularly care for him because he hasn't been helpful in the whole struggle around what is happening with black farmland. Right, right. Uh, so we hope to be able to talk about that a little bit. And it just so happens that there is a civil rights uh, piece of legislation that's on the table right now that was introduced by Cory Booker uh, to support black farmers. So we will see whether they get behind that piece of legislation and how um, supportive they are of it. But another thing that I, I found interesting um, during COVID is the impact on entertainment. Now, not just sports, but Broadway, um, you know, music, theater, so on and so forth, the movies. And I, I'd, I'd love for us to explore that uh, a, a lot more um, in 2021. Yeah, and, and, you know, because COVID laid out so many issues, it also brings up the issue of what was happening in the Native American communities who mm -hmm. were, mm -hmm. uh, if it's, it's hard to believe, but hard hit even uh, more so than the African American community was, mm -hmm. uh, as was the Latinx community. And, the, right. and then there's the issue of voting, right? <laughs> um, oh, and there's oh, been all this. Oh, oh vote? Oh. <laughs> there's been all is, this is there a problem with voting? <laughs> Not only the voter suppression, but the whole issue of where, uh, in addition to the whole disenfranchisement uh, issue, there's the question of what happened with the Latino vote, because there's controversy over that, uh, yep. with the established media saying they came out for Trump and other uh, sources that are more familiar with the Latinx community saying, no, in fact, they didn't. Um, and then there's the Native American vote, and we haven't mm -hmm. paid any attention to that. So there's so mm -hmm. many issues oh, yeah. that we have left Absolutely. to cover. It should be an exciting year. I look very much forward to it, and um, I look very much forward to expanding uh, our um, roles on the show. But let's talk about where people can listen to us. If you enjoyed what you heard today, visit our website, NubianTigersPodcast.com. In addition to the podcast, we also post a resource page for each subject to provide additional sources of information. Follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Nubian Tigers, written as one word. We are on YouTube on the Nubian Tigers podcast channel. And if you have a favorite podcast app, well, we're probably on it. You can subscribe to our podcast on Anchor FM, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, Spotify, and Stitcher. Just look for Nubian Tigers Talk. Looking forward to sharing some knowledge with you next time. Wake up, wake up, wake up.